Greetings, culture warriors. This is Jeff Yara, author of Culture is Everything, bringing you another dispatch from the front. Today, we're going to talk about another section of the paper than the business section, the news section. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about sports. Uh, no specific article here. I'm going to reference um, some news that's been fairly widespread uh, and just talk in more general terms about uh, what it says about business and culture. So in the NFL offseason, there's been an awful lot of news made uh, about various personnel moves that have happened. So uh, unless you've been living on the top of a mountain uh, in a cabin, sequestered away from the internet, you probably know that uh, Tom Brady quarterback for the New England Patriots, widely considered to be the greatest quarterback of all time, has left the Patriots and is going to be playing for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, His teammate, who had retired previously, Rob Gronkowski, tight end, is coming to Tampa Bay with him. There's talk, perhaps, of other players following suit and joining uh, up with the Patriots veteran in his new locale. But I want to use that story as an entree into a little more general discussion about sports. So a lot was mentioned that a big part of Brady's uh, decision to move on was discomfort with the culture in New England. Uh, That culture for that particular team is known as the Patriot Way, which basically consists of do your job, and uh, do as you're told, essentially, is the the nut of it. They also have an aspect of their culture, which is that Belichick, Bill Belichick, the coach and GM, does not want to uh, wait too long, give a wait too long into a player's career before making a move on him. So, in other words, if you've been around, his saying is is we would rather cut loose a player one year too early than one year too late. And New England's culture, because of the outstanding success that they've had over the past 20 years or so, is being widely emulated across the NFL. And across, I would argue, other leagues. Aaron Rodgers up in Green Bay (coughs) has been unhappy with the fact that the Green Bay Packers, his team, that he's been with his whole career, has drafted a first-round quarterback, signaling that they're looking for a replacement for him. Needless to say, he's not happy with that. He's begun grumbling that uh, perhaps he won't finish up his career in Green Bay as he originally thought. Of course, that's a little bit rife with irony because he replaced uh, Brett Favre, the great Green Bay quarterback, in fairly similar fashion. So he knows he should know the drill better than almost anybody. So Brett Favre did not finish up his career in Green Bay as he originally expected. He went on to a couple more teams before he finally retired. So I want you to think about what this says about the culture of those teams. And I'm going to tie it together for you with a phrase that uh, that's widely heard when these type of events occur in, in the sporting world. And that is, the NFL is a business. Major League Baseball is a business. The NBA is a business. The PGA is a business. You got to look after your business. And I just wonder, at what point did that mantra become an acceptable view of reality for professional athletes? And the reason I ask that question is, uh, as a lifelong fan of the Oakland Raiders, the legendary high point of the Raiders was 
about the mid 70s to the mid 80s. That was the bad boy era. That was where you had uh, a number, large number of their Hall of Fame players came through the team at that point. You had folks like Kenny Stabler. You had Fred Bolitnikoff, Dave Casper. You had Lester Hayes, George Atkinson, Phil Villapiano. You had legendary names like Dr. Death, the Mad Stork. You had guys like Lyle Alzado, Bill Romanowski, famous tough guys uh, who kind of gave that team uh, much of their identity. Famous running backs, Bo Jackson, Mar- I'm sorry, Marcus Allen. And that was an error wherein that team in particular, they didn't view the NFL as a business. They viewed it as an opportunity to play a game that they loved longer than they probably should have played it. Their philosophies came down to things like, if you aren't cheating, you aren't trying. Something that uh, probably shouldn't apply to a business, but certainly does apply to sports. But somewhere in the time between, say, the mid-80s and now, that mentality has shifted. And now professional athletes, you know, with their agents, um, with the never-ending contract negotiations, seem to view um, themselves as franchises of a business. You've seen a lot more come in, in in terms of metrics and performance data. Before it was a big deal if you sat down and watched uh, a lot of game film in preparation for the next week. Now, it really is a full-fledged data-gathering enterprise to scout your opponent, understand their tendencies, break them down. And uh, there's a lot of discipline that goes in to preparation. Again, I use the NFL example because that's simply the league that I'm most familiar with, but I think a lot of these principles apply regardless of the sport. If you watch a NASCAR race, uh, the sophistication involved in the performance tracking of the car and the driver and the communication used throughout the race is just phenomenal to see. If you haven't had a chance to take a look, there's um, they offer up on satellite uh, a speedway channel and even as someone who's not a particular fan of nascar listening into the discussions of the crew over the headsets is always fascinating the amount of science that comes into driving around a track in circles but with that discipline has become has come a perception that sports is very much a job now when you say professional athlete that's how they earn their money you you do view it as a job. But what's interesting is guys who, for most of them, until a very short time ago, played for the love of the game, are now viewing it through a very much different lens of business, where a different set of values is in play. A Bill Belichick can say, it's better to get rid of a player a year early than a year late if you're viewing a player as an asset upon which you get a return. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do from a business standpoint. Hey, this asset's underperforming, get rid of it. But it's very different when you're talking about a teammate. A lot of the tension, I think, in the uh, Tom Brady-Bill Belichick relationship came about because Tom Brady felt like he was dealing with an organization as a human being. No doubt his relationship with the owner of the Patriots, Robert Kraft, who refers to Tom Brady as, you know, uh, the son he never had, came into play. There are rumors that Bill Belichick wanted to keep Jimmy Garoppolo, who eventually got traded to San Francisco, 
and get rid of Tom Brady, trade Tom Brady uh, several years ago. And that it was Kraft who put a stop to it. It was the triumph of the human relationship over what at that point was how the numbers were looking. And a good thing. I think they won another Super Bowl since then. But that only goes so far. And Kraft clearly ceded authority on the decision of what to do about Tom Brady's contract to Bill Belichick, making the decision that he would rather keep Bill Belichick for the future than an an aging quarterback, even if he was closely tied personally with him. So Tom Brady lost his opportunity to finish out his career in the team he was so closely identified with. New England lost the opportunity to demonstrate that kind of loyalty to a player who has done so much for them. In addition to putting up the the championship wins and the playoff wins and the regular season wins that Tom Brady did, in addition to being the cement in the locker room supporting the Patriot way as a culture. It was Brady who smoothed these things over. It was Brady who actively recruited free agents to New England who were not exactly overjoyed at the prospect of working with Bill Belichick and living in that culture. It was Brady who brought them along. It was Brady who repeatedly reworked his contract when he didn't have to in order to take less money so that the Patriots under a salary cap could pay more talent to come to, to come to the New England. And it was Brady who, in the last few years, when New England has not been stocking up on offensive weapons to help him out, it was Brady who bore the brunt of that both in terms of his performance, missing bonuses because he didn't have the weapons he needed, and in terms of simply being underpaid relative to his performance. And so Brady looked looked at it quite reasonably, as I think any human would, as, hey, I helped this organization out greatly when the organization needed it. I didn't have to do that. I did it. I was I I was a team player. I supported the goal of the organization. When I need it, the organization's not there for me. And that reminds me of a business situation that I was in early in my career. I was working for a very well-regarded Fortune 500 company. I was new. I'd just come out of the military and so was beginning my corporate career. And like many making that adjustment, I was working extremely long hours and trying to kind of put my stamp on things. Uh, I shared an office with a person who was much further along in his career. He, he was probably 25 years into it at that point. Quiet guy, unassuming. And he just watched while I scrambled around, taking on special projects, supporting this, supporting that, coming in at the crack of dawn, staying well into the night, just trying to establish myself. And he would just note this and not say much. One day, when I was having a particularly frenetic day, uh, one day he made one comment that has stuck with me all these years later. He said, you know, the company will take from you all that you give it. And that brought me up short. On when when you hear that for the first time at the start, you think, well, yeah, of course, that's what they do. You know, right? They you you give 110%, they take 110%. That's what they do. But then you think about it a little bit more deeply, and you realize there is literally no amount of effort I can put in that they will not simply absorb and move on. When I move on to another job, another company. they'll simply move on to extracting from other people. It's like a machine that just 
sucks up lives. That's a very unsentimental way, certainly, to view business, but one that I think fits what we're discussing in terms of the culture in New England and probably in Green Bay. Sure, Tom Brady gave up a lot for the team. That was his job. If Tom Brady was undercompensated for that job, well, he agreed to it. He wanted to win. He wanted to be recognized as the greatest of all time, and he was. He was. And his sacrifice on the compensation front helped make that possible. Bill Belichick couldn't give up any money. He didn't count against the salary cap. I'm sure if it meant Bill Belichick giving up money in order to win a Super Bowl, he would sign up for it if that was the trade. But it wasn't the trade. The trade required Tom Brady to do that. Tom Brady did that. I'm sure that when Bill Belichick says very nice things about Tom Brady, he means them. But that does not mean that he agrees that Tom Brady was owed anything. Because you're paid on your current performance. And in quarterback in his 40s, even if he was previously the greatest of all time, is not likely to put up NFL most valuable player kind of numbers going forward. He can be great in the locker room. That's fantastic. But there are other players who can be great in the locker room too. So from the organization's perspective, they are doing what they said they were going to do. They didn't promise Tom Brady anything. They had a regular salary negotiation. It didn't work out. They move on. Period. Done. Thank you, Tom. You've been great. And we're on to the next. Belichick is famous for anything that comes up, no matter how earth-shattering during the week, he's on to the next week. He, he does not dwell in the past. Maybe when he's out on his fishing boat in the summer, he, he might give a little thought to it. But other than that, he is focused on the next task. And that's what the organization pays him to do. That is why, undoubtedly, Robert Kraft came around to Bill Belichick's position on Tom Brady. But is the business paradigm the right one for sports, even professional sports? Is it really all about the money you brought in? You know, I grew up in New England. Part of the reason that I am a Raiders fan is because New England was terrible when I was growing up. They were awful. They played in a game in 1982 against uh, the Colts, battling for the first-round draft pick the next year, which the worst team in the league gets. They had equal, you know, equally bad records at that point, played in the last game of the season, and uh, we called it the Super Bowl. Of course, 1982 was right before 1983, which was considered to be the best year of our lifetime for drafting a quarterback. That's where you got Dan Marino, uh, John Elway, Jim Kelly. They all came out that year. And so it was a golden opportunity to get a franchise quarterback in the draft. And these two teams were playing for the top pick. And it was to the point where... uh, about the only good player on the New England team uh, was their punter. Matt Kavanaugh, if I remember right. And uh, at one point, he kicked the ball backwards. And the Colts recovered it to put them in scoring position, and their coaches went, were livid. <laughs> because they, that meant they were probably going to win the game and lose the top draft pick. Uh, so... There was not a culture of winning, a culture of excellence. There was a couple of bright spots, very far apart, 1976, 1985, with some playoff parents. That was it. That was it. It was a dreadful, dismal team. Awful. By far the worst team in New England. And that changed once Bill Belichick came over from the Jets. It started to change with Bill Parcells. He really righted the ship um, and got them to where they were a 
you know, a legit team. But of course, it was Parcel. It was a uh, Bill Belichick who brought the uh, the Super Bowl rings home. And so you can understand why that you know paradigm that's associated with him would be considered to be the ticket. But is that the case? Should it be the case? There's another paradigm that could be in play here. Uh, in the military. It's not really, the war is not really viewed as a business. Sure, there are aspects of management that have crept into military leadership. For the most part, they were resisted by the culture. I can well remember bringing in, as uh, part of the Quality Air Force Initiative, back in the 90s, bringing in some simple uh, quality tools and using them to help manage my flight. And that was heavily resisted. Because our job is not to make money. Our job is to win wars. And it was viewed skeptically, especially by folks who had been around uh, at the tail end of the Vietnam era, who remembered how disastrously that went when Robert McNamara and his whiz kids from Ford tried to remake the Department of Defense along modern management theory lines. And it was... Awful. That's how you wound up with the body counts from General West Moreland and the emphasis on fudging the numbers around how many uh, Viet Cong were killed. That's where it all came from. And so there was a strong culture resisting that within the military because it was such an abject failure. But the military culture is built differently. It's around the importance of the team. People recognize that the folks that are fighting on the front line, are they're usually your junior enlisted personnel. And the Air Force is a little bit different because uh, fighter pilots are officers. And bomber, you know, pilots in general are officers. So you, there's a little bit of a different dynamic. But if you look at the other armed services, who's actually pulling the trigger? Well, it's generally the 18 and 20 year olds. Uh, so it's it's v- the focus is very much on the need to support the person at the pointy end of the spear, as we used to call it. And so they have a leadership model in the military, which can best be summarized by saying leaders eat last. What they mean is, is when everybody's uh, gathering for a meal, in the mess hall or wherever, put in a, a long, hard day by that point, and looking to get something to eat, what you shouldn't see is the highest ranking person going first through the line. Can't say that you don't see that sometimes, you do, but the ethos of the military is you take care of your troops first. When they are fed, when they are taken care of, then you eat whatever's left. Same thing goes if you're out in the field and you're, you know, building camp. Well, you don't get yourself set up first. You check in on all of your troops and make sure that they're okay and that they've got shelter. And then you take care of yourself. You know, and a lot of times that means you, you know, you sleep wherever you can find a a place. That's the model in the military. That's what binds people together. And it all serves the purpose of, in a combat situation, it drives the right behavior. You know, the most important person on the battlefield is not the general. The most important person on the battlefield is whoever is raining fire upon the enemy. That's just the reality of it. The the general's probably got a a pistol <laughs> and uh they're they're probably not the best shot you know they're important from the standpoint of uh of the overall strategy of the battle of the morale impact on the uh, force but in terms of the actual fighting um they're not have not been historically and are not now so why not that ethos for the locker room 
After all, Bill Belichick isn't going to throw a pass, isn't going to catch a pass, and isn't going to block anybody. He can plan all he wants to, and there's probably no one better at putting a plan together, but at the end of the day, it's the players who execute. And we're going to find out this coming season how well those players execute without having the locker room glue that was Tom Brady. One of the knocks against Aaron Rodgers is that he is not much of a leader. He's a great talent, very good at playing quarterback, but he doesn't really lead the team. Brady clearly led the team. But I wonder, is should the professional athlete be looking to a different paradigm for success, more towards that band of brothers that we hear referred to um, with regard to uh, military personnel. These are folks who are who, who remain bonded, even if they were only together for a relatively short time early in their lives, they remain cemented together forever. You know, they do reunions periodically. And it's not it's not really a natural thing. I remember at the Air Force Academy every year, the men who took part in the Doolittle Raids, this was the, after Pearl Harbor, this was the first opportunity to strike back at the Japanese, were these brave souls who took off in B-25s um, from the, the decks of the remaining carrier, knowing that they were going to have to ditch their aircraft because they didn't have the range but so eager to strike back at the Japanese homeland after what they had done to Pearl Harbor. That uh, they were willing to deal with all that uncertainty. What do you do when you bail out over Japan? At that time, Japan had dominated the Pacific region. So even if you managed to successfully bomb it and then turn away, you had to land either in the ocean, somewhere in China. You had to rely on partisans to help you get back home. But that was how desperate these men were to strike a blow for America. And they would gather every year to drink a toast to those who had not made it at the Air Force Academy. And it was a big to do the the reunion. It, it only recently stopped with the passing of the last Doolittle Raider. That is a powerful culture. That is a group of folks who took on insurmountable odds with great uncertainty and did their job. So as we think about and look at these situations in the world of sport. I wonder if it wouldn't be better to be more like a Doolittle Raider and a little less like a corporate Raider. I wonder if that wouldn't serve the teams and the people on those teams well. I wonder if that wouldn't inject a little more humanity into these discussions and help us turn away from the notion that a professional athlete is nothing more than a cog in a machine who can be easily replaced. How many times in history have we seen people who are Hall of Famers in terms of their performance who today could not survive getting through the combine or who if they were in the minor league would eke out an existence barely in one of the lower echelons simply because they don't look like a perfect cog for that machine. 
You know, Steve Largent, Hall of Fame wide receiver, was 5'8". Not the sort of person you think would be able to go up and fight six foot, five inch cornerbacks for a football. And yet there you have it. Doug Flutie was 5'10". And everyone said he couldn't play. And all the guy ever did in his NFL career, it seemed, was win. And winning was supposedly what it was all about until it wasn't. So I think uh, as we come out of the pandemic, the craziness that that's uh, injected into the maelstrom that is the off seasons for these leagues, it might be wise to rethink a little bit the spread and prevalence of that business culture and start giving players and fans something a little nobler to aspire to. Now, there's nothing wrong with business culture. Obviously, I'm all about business culture. But I think we're starting to go too far astray from the basic humanity involved in any successful enterprise. And we would be very wise to do what we can to swing that pendulum back. Sports would be a great place to start because I think you'll find that a team of people with a shared purpose, sacrificing for each other, is a much stronger bond than a group of independent franchises angling to take a nickel from the next. But hey, sports are one thing, and culture is everything. Thank you. Have a good day. (laughs) 